Position recaps roll on. Next up, we jump into that pesky outfield position. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Tuesday, November 29th. Frank Stample joined once again by a festive Scott White. The setup has changed. He's gone back to the OG. Christmas tree is up behind him. Oh, All yeah. lit up. Ornaments ready to go. The Santa hat is on. I yes. Love it, Scotty, I love it. It's Christmas season, baby. Christmas. Christmas. I've held off. All right. I let you people have your month of November. <laughs> it's technically still November, right? But I, I, I get it. You know, before Thanksgiving... Christmas cheer it's a, little, it's a little it's a little early for that you know some people want to start it right after Halloween no that's you know you got you got to let you got to let the Thanksgiving happen but once Thanksgiving is here you know the very next day the tree went up I wrapped 28 gifts last week 28 Frank 20 you, I, I, I don't have that much more to do to be honest you're an animal I'm an animal, yes, and uh, I just I might just wear the Santa hat every show until uh, until Christmas comes. I am all about it, Scotty, and you know what? Christmas tree is going up this weekend in the Stample House, and if I stumble across a Santa hat somewhere, I will join you. All and right, we will, let's we do will, it. We'll be both wearing Santa hats. Santa December, December to December. remember. You know what's crazy about happen. everything you just said is that most people do their Christmas shopping on Black Friday or Cyber Monday, if you're watching us live right now on YouTube. And you said that you wrapped all of your gifts last week, Scott. So when did you when did you get all of your gifts? <laughs> Early last week. <laughs> you, that just... you know, no, it's funny. My, awesome. my, my, both of my sons, which, uh, you know, obviously they're who I'm buying most of the gifts for because they're children. Um, both of their birthdays are in the fall. So like the way I go about shopping for their birthdays is I just buy a lot of stuff and I figure out what I'm actually going to give them for their birthday. And, and some of the stuff I just, I just hold back till Christmas, you know? All right. Hey, makes sense to me. I am a, a November baby as well. So uh, that makes sense. Anyway, today on the show, Scott, we are recapping the outfield position. Today is one of those shows, and I told Scott before we started, the rundown is just absolutely packed. I have a recap of the top 20 outfielders, then Scott's top 24 ranked for next season, 2023. I don't know how many how, how many of those names we'll actually get to, but we'll try our best. And of course, we do have some news. Nothing crazy big going on, but Jose Abreu to the Astros is actually where we're going to start. We had Hunter Renfro get traded to the Angels, uh, and we do have a confirmation on Tommy John surgery for Bryce Harper. That's all coming up a little bit later on, but you think they're going to clip this Jose Abreu analysis? Like, should I take the Santa hat off in case they're going to clip it to use it as a separate video? You know, because sometimes they do that a little, little, you little realize, behind the curtain here. You realize whenever you say they, you're just talking about me, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't realize. Are you going to clip the Jose Abreu analysis, Frank? I am 1000% going to clip the Jose Abreu analysis. All right. I'll just, I'll take off this hat. We'll All see right. how, how messed up is my hair. Like I'm, you, I'm, 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 I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of at this point in life where I'm like, you know, like, don't touch the hair, you know, with my kids, don't touch the hair. Like it, it actually stays put. Like I, I wake up and my hair is like this. I don't have to do anything to it. It's weird. I bought this new pillow. And for some reason that, that contributes to it. Like it's weird, but Okay, so I think the hair's I think the hair's still put together after the Santa hats on, so we can do this. Jose consider, Abreu analysis. Consider yourself lucky, Scott. As soon as we finish Jose Abreu, that Santa hat is going right back on. Okay. Jose Abreu is signing with the Houston Astros last year. He hit 304, 15 home runs, 85 runs, 75 RBI with the White Sox, of course. And uh both the home runs and the RBI were his lowest in any of his eight full seasons. But Scott, as we mentioned on our first base recap. Jose Abreu still really crushed the ball. 93rd percentile average exit velocity, 97th percentile hard hit rate, 296 expected batting average, and he's got a park shift upgrade here going into Houston. Obviously, they got that short porch in left field, and it's a lineup upgrade. It's a huge lineup upgrade. Not to discount the White Sox. They have a very good lineup themselves, but they're not the Houston Astros. So... Earlier in the offseason, I noticed you had Jose Abreu ranked seventh at first base. Do you plan on moving him up? 
Probably not. Like I've I've come to terms with the idea that if I have any chance of getting Vinny Pasquantino, I have to make him number six at first base. Uh, and in points leagues specifically, I might have Anthony Rizzo ahead of Abreu because uh, the low strike. Oh, you know, then again, Jose Abreu had a low strikeout rate himself last year. Uh, he doesn't walk only... very much for points leagues, though. Yeah, but it was 16.2%. It was the best strikeout rate of his career. Just just all around a weird season for Jose Abreu. His home runs were cut in half from 2021, 30 to 15. Um, and I think that was, I mean, th- that's really all you can knock for. He had over 300. He, like I said, the low strikeout rate. Uh, he hit the ball very hard, as you point out. So I, I guess the early... Um, hesitance to draft him and, and of course we're dealing with tiny a tiny sample of drafts with a lot more off season to happen so it's, it, it feels kind of funny to even talk about any mock draft data but it's out there and jose abreu was going in my opinion crazy late considering his reputation his his track record and the fact that i look at that stat line from last year with the 15 home runs and it looks totally fluky to me i mean this He's 35, I get it, so you can make the argument, okay, he's getting old. So that's why the home runs declined. Maybe that's an argument to make. Um, The ball changed, and we saw power production go down, particularly for certain players. But the reason why I don't think either of those arguments holds water is because, A, Jose Abreu hit the ball as hard as ever, his... Average exit velocity, 93rd percentile. His hard hit rate, 97th percentile. So that doesn't, co- combined with the career low strikeout rate, that doesn't scream regression. And B, the kinds of players who saw their power sapped were the ones not hitting the ball that hard. The ones who had middling exit, middling to low exit velocities. They were the guys who, were, who really suffered from the new ball. And Jose Abreu doesn't fit into that category either. Uh, his X slug was 486, 92nd percentile, despite his actual slug being only 446. So that would suggest it was it was kind of a fluky thing as well. And uh, I, I think there's a good chance, even, even if he wasn't going to Houston, that Jose Abreu would have a big bounce back season. Because other than the home run total, I don't see in what way he declined. But now he is going to Houston, where... Uh, Statcast says uh, estimates he would have had seven more home runs if he played all his games in Houston than he, than he actually had last season. So it it does appear to be a, a park upgrade just by that measure. And yeah, the loaded lineup. I mean, Jose Abreu, and and I know you know since the time of Moneyball, we've we've dismissed RBI as an individual achievement. It's just kind of something that happens it's 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 by happenstance that you get an rbi total the the people batting around you where you're batting in the lineup this contributes to a big rbi total it's not something a a hitter has direct control over but jose abreu over the years has looked like an exception to that rule like he he has this uncanny knack for getting rbi and uh, his 162 game pace over his entire career is 110 rbi he had 117 RBI in a bad, a pretty bad White Sox lineup in 2021 and uh, led the AL and RBI the two years before that. So, like, this guy is great at driving in runs, and now he has this amazing Astros lineup that he's a part of. That's only going to help with uh, that, that already existing strength of his. And uh, you factor in the the obvious batting average potential, the likelihood of him rebounding power wise. And I, I think, yeah, I think this is, I don't think he needed this good news, but in a way I'm kind of like, okay, he's this move to the Astros is perceived as such an upgrade for Jose Abreu that like everybody else is probably going to catch up to where I already was with him. That's what I think is going to happen. So the early 80 piece got through 40 dress again, small sample, a lot more to happen here in the off season. 127.6 for Jose Abreu as the 10th first baseman off the board. My guess is that he now pushes that top 100, maybe even gets inside the top 100, which is right where Vinny Pasquantino and Nate Lowe are currently going. So I think Jose Abreu is kind of going to wind up in a similar tier as those guys. 
And I think that makes sense based on everything that you just said. The top six in the Astros lineup projected to be Jose Altuve, Alex Bregman, Jordan Alvarez, Jose Abreu, Kyle Tucker, Jeremy Pena. Are you kidding me? That's that's an insane lineup. So I think it's an absolutely great landing spot. Last point on him, and I've referenced this in years past. Jose Abreu being a, a Cuban-born player, this is something he's talked about in the past, where he's gotten off to slow starts. It's really cold in the months of March and April in Chicago. That's he's now point. going to be playing in Houston inside of a dome and in the AL West. So maybe he doesn't get off to that slow start. Maybe I'm maybe I'm reaching here, Scott, but it's something I've always thought about when it comes to Jose Abreu. I wouldn't surprise me. I, I mean, I wouldn't have put much stock in that prior to this year. Well, really, it's the last two years, but you know, especially this year, the way we saw offense suppressed to such an extreme in those colder months. Yeah, if you can avoid the cold, I think that's good for any hitter. And, you know, if it's something Jose Abreu specifically has talked about, then I guess even more so for him. All right, last points on this entire trade. I guess the fallout from the White Sox perspective, Andrew Vaughn is now free to play first base, which is what we expected because the White Sox basically said they weren't going to bring Jose Abreu back, uh, which means Eloy Jimenez could see more time as the regular DH for the White Sox. Hopefully that can help keep him on the field. And it's also good news for Matt Mervis, the Cubs first base prospect, because they were also linked to Jose Abreu. Uh, I guess they could still bring in a first baseman or a DH type, but you know, obviously for now that helps the the idea of Matt Mervis being on the opening day roster for the Chicago Cubs. Let's jump into the outfield recap for this past season. Scott, let's get that Santa hat back on. Let's run through oh. the top. Uh, I've got about the top 20 from this past year in Roto. Could mention, you know, what they did a little bit in head to head points leagues as well. We're going to work through clusters of three at a time. Quick thought on each, Scott, because obviously there's so many names to get to here. And we will start with the top three. And Aaron Judge, first overall in Roto this past season, no surprise. Mookie Betts finished ninth overall in Roto. And Jordan Alvarez was 10th overall in that format. Uh, both Betts and Alvarez averaged 3.8 fantasy points per game, which is a great mark. Aaron Judge was the only player to clear 700 points in head-to-head -head points leagues. And that was 90 points more than Sandy Alcantara, the next <laughs> closest player. Just and I imagine, awesome. like... No hitter came, no other hitter came close to Sandy Alcantara, much less passing him. There was not a single hitter over 600 fantasy points last year, Scott. Except for Judge, who was over 700, is what Correct. you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Distant, yeah. distant first among hitters. And he was a distant first in Roto, too. It's, you know, it's a little easier yeah. to measure in head to head. Uh, but he was a distant first in both. And um, I think. I think it's a pretty easy call to take him not just number one in the outfield, but number one overall. Now, this uh, this isn't a um, – I don't think this is the consensus view, at least not right now. Uh, but I am I am willing to die on this hill. If this means I get Aaron Judge anytime I'm picking in the first five picks, then I am happy to do that because, you know, I guess the arguments I've heard against him – Number one is, oh, well, you know, outlier season. You don't you don't pay for somebody's career season. First of all, in Judge's case, 62 home runs, not that big of an outlier. He hit 52 as a rookie, remember? And 62 in the, after the power suppressed season we just had, it was 16 more than any other player. Kyle Schwarber was second with 46, and uh, I think third was, I don't remember who was third, but it was quite a bit behind that also. Um, so I'm not asking him to hit 62 again. I think if he hits 45 or so, it'll be enough to justify it because what we've seen from judge apart from the power product. Okay. So I, I, I got to try and keep my argument, you know, I, I got to try and keep it presented in a way that, you know, you, you can follow along easily. I'm already failing in that regard, but judge has always been. Since since that rookie season when he hit 52 home runs, he's always stood out for how hard he hits the ball. Giancarlo Stanton was up there with him. Um, a couple other hitters might come close sometimes, but consistently Judge has been not just someone who hits the ball really hard, but pretty much the guy who hits the ball the hardest. And as we've seen already prior to last year, it could lead to big home run outcomes. 
But I think what we saw last year is that with those middling exit velocity guys no longer hitting home runs at the same rate because of the new ball, because of the humidor, the quality of contact matters more than ever. And for somebody who stands out in the way Judge does, it's going to mean he distances himself from the pack in home runs. Before it was kind of wasted exit velocity. Now it's exit velocity that translates to more home runs. So he doesn't need to hit 62, but I think he's still the odds on favorite to lead the majors in home runs. And I think, I think if he gets to 45, that'll make him worth a number one overall pick because also what we've seen from judge strikeout rate has gone down in recent years. He's now about a 25% guy. Uh, that means he's a net benefit in batting average. Now he hit over 300 this past year. doesn't necessarily need to do that either, but, we know he's capable of it. We also saw him, saw him steal 18 bases. This, 16. 16 bases. Okay, people are acting like Judge is zero for speed. Maybe he goes back to being a zero for speed, but you know, stealing bases is going to be a lot easier next year. And even if that doesn't help him, it's going to help the league, the rest of the league so much that you don't need to sell out like crazy for stolen bases. And look, there's a chance he gives you 15 plus again. So... Not everything has to go right for Judge. He doesn't have to repeat the season he just had. He, I think if he gets 75, 80% of the way there, you know, seeing how distant of a first he was among hitters, uh, I think it'll be worth a first, a number one overall pick. Of course, maybe he gets hurt. He's shown a tendency to do that in the past, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to sweat that so much um, because, you know, a lot of the other first rounders have injury histories of their own. You know what, Scott? You said it right, especially at this position, man. As we run through outfield, you're going to see how many names are injury-prone at this position. So Judge has now stayed healthy for two seasons in a row, and I'll tell you just one more reason why the exit velocity matters for him. He made a conscious change last year, Scott, to hit the ball in the air more and to pull the ball more, which resulted in a clear outlier home run season. So I don't know that why he would change that approach now. You know, I don't. No one's expecting him to hit 60 home runs. But it wouldn't surprise me one bit if he comes close to hitting 50 again, if he stays healthy. Uh, the other two names here I just wanted to quickly mention, Mookie Betts and Jordan Alvarez are projected to be first-round picks. And I will say, even with Mookie Betts, I think that he's slightly undervalued right now. I think his ADP is around 10th. I, I think he's worthy of being a, a top-five pick overall, uh, regardless of format Yeah, in fantasy. Yeah, I actually have him... I have him third. I have him third overall. Second in the outfield, third overall. Uh, I agree. I think, uh, again, I, I think there's this tendency I and mean, it, it's been going on for a few years now to, um, to really target the steals guys above all else early on. And I think, I think 2022 already started to, to dissuade people like 2022 with, with power becoming harder to come by, uh, began to devalue the stolen base in a way people haven't completely caught up to yet. And I think 2023 with the new rules put in place and the stolen base explosion I'm expecting is going to, to completely um, undermine that approach. So somebody like Mookie Betts whose steals have declined since he joined the Dodgers, first of all, they may go up again because he's going to have more incentive to run too. And uh, even if they don't, they're just, like I said, for Judge, they're just not going to be so valuable that you should be passing up everything Mookie Betts delivers, which is a ridiculous number of combined runs and RBI, especially the runs batting high in that Dodgers lineup. All right. Well, four through six in the outfield this past season was Kyle Tucker, who finished 14th overall, Adolis Garcia, 16th overall, and Julio Rodriguez, who finished 17th overall, uh, Tucker. Batting average and expecting bat, uh, expected batting average both took a bit of a step back. He's a career 268 hitter. I think that's probably what you should expect from Kyle Tucker moving forward. Adolis Garcia, two straight seasons, 27 plus homers, 16 steals. Did make some improvements as well. Lowered the strikeout rate, lowered his ground ball rate a little bit, hits the ball extremely hard. I'm starting to just kind of buy it when it comes to Adolis Garcia. Julio Rodriguez, I mean, we can do a whole podcast just about this kid, Scott. I mean, what he did as a rookie, 28 homers, 25 steals. In fact, these three hitters I just mentioned, 
They were three of four hitters, the only four hitters, with 25-plus homers and 25-plus steals this past season. Julio, just a freak athlete, 92nd percentile average exit velocity, 97th percentile sprint speed. We all saw what he did in the home run derby. Power for days. Only slight negatives I could find, Scott, on Julio. Which, look, if we're talking about taking him as a top three or top five overall pick, you know, we, we got to point out the flaws too here. Yeah, sure. The ground ball rate is a little high, in my opinion, 46%. I, I think it's something he could lower a little bit more. It wouldn't surprise me one bit. It's not egregious, but it's just a touch high. And he only had four steals in the second half. They didn't really need him to run as much in that second half when he started hitting for power. He was just kind of more of the catalyst for the for the lineup moving forward. So those are just a few things that stood out to me. Uh, but obviously, this is a great group. Julio, Adolis Garcia, and Kyle Tucker. Yeah, I mean, if we're if we're talking about where we draft them next year, Adolis Garcia would be well behind these others. Uh, he's the only one we've mentioned so far, top six outfielders from this past year, who isn't a first rounder for me next year. And uh, I mean, f- what five of the top six or, or four of the. Yeah, basically, Adolis Garcia is the only one who isn't a first rounder that we've mentioned so far. Uh, you meant you you said Kyle Tucker. You think he's probably just a 260 hitter? 268 is his career batting average. Yeah, so closer to 270, I guess. Yep. I think. Look, he hit 294 in 2021, which was 140 games, so full season, and his strikeout rate is consistently low. It was. Uh, about 16% this past year, uh, 15.6%. I mean, that's really good. The XBA was still, you know, it was in the 260s also. Okay, he put the ball in the air a lot, uh, more than he ever has, which kind of compromised the batting average a bit. But I, I think he'll find the happy medium there. And I, maybe he'll only hit 265 or so again. But I think there's the upside for a lot more with Kyle Tucker. So I'm I'm not ready to just say that's – to condemn him to that, to condemn him to being just kind of an average batting average guy. I think he could be a real help there. And the most impressive thing uh, for me from Kyle Tucker is that he stole 25 bases. Remember, I was worried he wouldn't be able to repeat the 14 he stole in 2021, and he almost doubled it getting to 25. He's not very fast, but he's had a good success rate. And, of course, those rule changes – only figure to help him as well. Uh, so I don't see any reason he'll he'll be slowing down moving forward. Uh, yeah, the only thing I would point out, Scott, and I agree, like, if I were projecting him, projections are, are usually median projections, like the most yeah. likely outcome. Again, I think I, I would expect 270. It wouldn't surprise me if he hit 290 or hit 300. But if you look at his expected batting averages by season, according to StatCast, 262, 303, 261, 263, 264. There's a clear outlier. So that's yeah. what I'm going based on. The, so far the 303 Kyle. in 2021 was his expected batting average. But yeah. Yeah. You know, he's still he's still a pretty inexperienced guy. He's only had two full seasons. So yeah. I'll I'll give Kyle Tucker a little little more benefit of the doubt there. Either way, I mean, deserves to be a first round pick. Hey, as we'll talk about later on, something that I don't think you agree with based on your rankings, I would take Kyle Tucker over Juan Soto this season. But I'll save that for a little bit later on. Seven through nine in the outfield this past season was Kyle Schwarber, who finished 20th overall, Randy Rosarena, 32nd overall, and Mike Trout, who finished 33rd overall, just behind Randy Rosarena. Uh, Schwarber, monster power year, 46 homers, 100 runs, 94 RBI, 10 steals? Where did that come <laughs> from? Career high, never had more than four steals before in any season, and he's 29th percentile in sprint speed, so... I guess people just weren't holding him on. They weren't paying attention, and Schwarber took advantage. So, shout out to him. 218 batting average, that's really bad. Like, really, <laughs> really bad. He leaned into the fly ball approach, uh, career high, 51% fly ball rate, tanked his BABIP, tanked his batting average. He was terrible against lefties as well. Uh, so, I-, I think those are places where he could get better. You know, Maybe he gets up to like a 240, 250 hitter, but personally, yeah. I-, I don't know that I would expect much more than that from him. Uh, Randy Rosarena, 20 homers, 32 steals. He gets caught stealing a lot, Scott. He's not a very efficient base runner, but the Rays continue to let him run wild. So and I maybe have... he'll become more efficient because the rules are getting easier, Frank. 
I, I don't he, know if you heard. He's ridiculous. <laughs> he's like so fast, Scott, where it would not surprise me one bit if he gets up over 40 steals. Randy Rosarena does. Yeah. Uh, and then Mike Trout, he had 40 home runs in 119 games. It, it was still a really, really good season for Mike Trout. But now we have this lingering chronic back condition. He's consistently missed time over the past four or five seasons anyway. Some kind of weird stuff going on. Underlying numbers too, Scott, like strikeout rate up two years in a row for Trout. Uh, fly ball rate 57 percent that's like by far a career high seems like he's kind of selling out for power a little bit at this point too um honestly i i don't know that i love any of these players i still like schwarber quite a bit in headset points but uh that the, these were the seven through nine this past season schwarber rosarina trout okay repeat that you don't you don't know that you like any of i don't know that i love any of these players like just looking at early adp you know trout's a second round pick a Rosa Reina is like a third rounder. I think Schwarber is a fourth rounder. It's, I don't know that I like the value on any of them right now, but I'm still kind of, well, here's the thing, Frank, we've talked about the relative strength, which positions are rel are strong, weak, well, relative to the others. And that's easier yeah. to, uh, to pinpoint on the infield where second base, you know, there's not a lot going on there. Third base. It's really good at the top, but then it's basically gone by the time you get to to round five, round six, seven or so. Outfield is about the same way. Like six of the first eight picks, most of the first round in your draft is probably going to be outfielders. But then once the good ones are gone, they're there's not a lot to get it. It it gets awful quickly. And this especially shows up in five outfielder drafts, three outfielder drafts, you know, and, and I'm thinking especially head to head leagues where um, you might be more focused on pitching anyway than you are in, in Roto leagues. You might not notice how weak outfield is so much because uh, obviously there are fewer outfield spots to fill across the league, but in five outfielder leagues, like, I've never been a big proponent of filling outfield early. I, I I usually, it's not uncommon for me to draft four or five infielders before I draft my first outfielder. That might be completely backward for me this year too. So particularly if you're somebody who takes Jose Ramirez in round one, Trey Turner in round one, somebody like that, you're probably going to get one of these outfielders. At least you should because it gets ugly fast. Um. I agree. If I can just give a quick comment here on each of these guys, I agree. Kyle Schwarber, probably not better than a 240 hitter or so, but I think he's pretty likely because of the uh, the shift limitations to get back to being about a 240 hitter. His XBA was 237, even with the extreme fly ball rate. And you know, I've said particularly for left-handed hitters, if you see the disparity between the XBA and the BA, that's kind of a shorthand way to to know the guy's going to benefit from that shift ban. So uh, keep that in mind with Schwarber. Arosa Reina had terrible expected stats again for the second straight season. But I like I think we're at a point with Arosa Reina where we can just ignore the stat cast data. Like it just it just doesn't do a good job of measuring what he's all about. So I'll take his numbers at face value at this point and uh, treat him like a high end number two outfielder. Uh, Trout. Trout, I'd draft ahead of either of those guys. I think Trout's still a borderline first rounder, but he's unlikely to get back to stealing bases. I, I mean, I'm 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 kind of leaving that door open, the stolen base door open for everybody uh, with the rule changes next year. But Trout seems less likely because of his health concerns, because of the chronic back issue, and you got to worry about him missing time. But not only that, he's no longer a batting average standout because his strikeout rate has spiked the past couple of years. Uh, so I wouldn't expect much more than a, in a good scenario, a 280 mark from him. So that that serves to bring down his value along with the stolen base struggles. All right, let's move on through uh, to 10 through 12 in the outfield this past season. Cedric Mullins fin finished 41st overall, George Springer 45th overall, and Michael Harris, the National League Rookie of the Year, 56th overall in Roto. Uh, I think both Mullins and... Harris will profile as better Roto category players. Uh, George Springer, always been a great head-to-head -head points player. Started running a little bit more this season again. 14 steals, his highest steal output since 2015, when George Springer had 16 steals. 
Um, you know, Scott, I don't know which outfielders I'm going to draft because I don't like any of them. <laughs> I like outside of the first like three or five that we mentioned, Cedric Mullins, he still had a fine season 16 homers, yeah, 34 steals. The OPS went from 878 in 2021 to 721 this past year. He was terrible against lefties. There was a point in, I think, July and August where he was actually sitting against some lefties. Uh, Cedric Mullins was. So that kind of concerns me. George Springer, he was really good, but injury issues. He hasn't played uh, 140 games since 2018. He had a bone spur removed from his right elbow in the offseason. He should be good to go for spring training. Uh, and then Michael Harris, super talented dude. I really like him, but the price is sky high already. And there, you know, there are some warning signs there. Scott, he doesn't walk very much. Very high ground ball rate, 56%. Yeah, yeah you mentioned Julio Rodriguez yeah. was high. Michael, Michael Harris's ground ball rate is astronomical. And he was bad against lefties as a rookie. You know, 238 batting average, 649 OPS. It kind of concerns me, so... Three more names yeah. here. Three more I don't like. Cedric Mullins, George Springer, Michael Harris. I mean, just by virtue of scarcities, you know, outfield is scarce. Stolen bases are thought of as scarce. Uh, batting average, the fact Michael Harris hit over 300. You know, that's pretty scarce. He's probably going to be a borderline second, third round guy in Roto Leagues. And I may even draft him myself because I, I do want to get outfielders, outfield filled early. Outfield filled early, but yeah, I have I I share your concerns for Michael Harris. Uh, obviously, he didn't play a full season, so we didn't get to see the normal ebb and flow. And uh, we we did see him slump once in the middle, and he kind of rebounded for a couple weeks. But then it was a very slow finish, two twenty two with a home run in his final nineteen games, and that carried over into the postseason, which is only a handful of games for the Braves. But Michael Harris basically did nothing, and you know, you factor in all the the concerning data there, and yeah, maybe he's maybe he's going to have a bit of a sophomore slump. I I think I think some regression is to be expected. How much? You know, maybe still enough to make him a worth the third round pick, but it's uh, it, it's it's a little hard. He's a little hard to project right now. Um, I, I'm I'm to the point, and I know he had the 14 stolen bases, but I'm to the point where I think of George Springer as more of a, a head to head point specialist. Because I'm not even, I'm not sure how much to trust those stolen bases, first of all, given, especially with how injury prone he is. But also, we've seen big power production from him in the past. I'm not sure we're going to see big power production from him anymore. I, I think he'll, it'll be good power, but he's not one of those guys who hits the ball especially hard. So I could see, you know, it was hard to tell this past year because he missed so much time with injury, but I could see, uh, I could see him underwhelming as a power hitter moving forward. And if you don't have speed and you're not going to be a batting average standout, you know, he, George Springer might be kind of middling moving forward. It's not exactly young. And I'm kind of working backwards here, but I, Cedric Mullins real quick. Our first Roto mock draft, a 12 teamer, five outfielder spots to fill. Obviously I got Cedric Mullins in round five. Like if I can do that, like if I can, if I can get like a surefire 30 steel guy, or who knows, maybe it'll be 45 steals uh, in, in round five. Like that definitely takes the pressure off in round one to, to get a big steals guy. Like that's, that's, I, I think maybe the reaction to Cedric Mullins uh, 2022 follow-up. I don't know. I think maybe some people are being too dismissive. The fact is power declined. Okay. A lot of hitters power declined. I don't know that. I, I feel like maybe he's being singled out in that way. And he's still going to be a relevant home run contributor. And, and of course, a big steals guy. And maybe now is not the time to bail, right? When the Orioles lineup is just about to maybe not be good, but it, they're going to get better, right? Gunnar Henderson, Ali Rutschman, Anthony Santander, we're about to talk about. So they do have some pieces. The yeah. ADP is, you're right, Scott. It's not, it's not terrible so far. 49 uh, through 47 NFBC drafts. Hey, you know, he he could be a good name, Cedric Mullins, to pair with Aaron Judge. Take Aaron Judge, you know, top three pick, and take Cedric Mullins at the 4-5 turn. I, I feel like those guys complement each other quite well. 13 through 15 in the outfielders, we have Starling Marte, 68th overall. Uh, Dalton Varsha was 69th overall. We spoke about him on our catcher episode. And Anthony Santander was 71st overall. 
Uh, for Starling Marte, another solid season, 292 batting average, 16 homers, 18 steals. Did have nine caught stealing, which I don't really like to see as a 34-year-old outfielder. You know, maybe starting to lose some of that efficiency. Uh, but he missed the end of the season with a fractured finger. He underwent core muscle surgery in early November. Eight-week recovery for that. So Starling Marte should be fine for spring training. By January, he should be good to go by then. And then obviously, you know, February, March is when we actually uh, get spring training up and running there. Um, again, some worrisome signs, Scott. 34-year-old outfielder, 18 for 27 on, this, on the steals, and not nearly as aggressive as he was the year before. His sprint speed also dropped down to 183rd in baseball, 68th percentile. So just some warning signs. I, I think overall, I still kind of like Starling Marte this year. Uh, and Anthony Santander... He just stayed healthy, Scott. It was a career year across the board. He finally stayed healthy for 152 games. He hit 240, 33 homers, 89 RBI. He hits the ball relatively hard. He puts it in the air. His barrel rate is pretty good. Just mm -hmm. not very, not a very sexy pick, Scott. You know, Santander. Lower batting average, good power. He's kind of like a Kyle Schwarber light. What do you think about uh, Santander and Starling Marte? All right, Santander, I, I think... Uh you know, Kyle Schwarber might be setting the bar too high. I, I think of him in that Hunter Renfro tier, someone who we haven't mentioned here, but that's, uh, I, I think that's the sort of contribution Anthony Santander could make in fantasy, by the way, Hunter Renfro got traded, uh, since our last podcast, right? Or did you record one after that without me? We are going to talk about it in that okay. just a bit. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, Santander, like I prefer Renfro because Santander does have that injury history, but if he's healthy, he should contribute home runs at a good rate and not a whole lot else. Uh, the one I really want to talk about here is Starling Marte because I think he's kind of, I think he's going to be a pretty divisive player. He is getting old. His best attribute has been speed at a time when that's going to become less important and at a time when. He wasn't as good as it when we last saw him. So what is he bringing to the table? Well, still a good batting average, probably. Um, it's not a zero for power, but if he's not going to be that standout in stolen bases anymore, and maybe he will be, but, you know, even if he is, he's missed a at least a quarter of the past couple seasons with injury and, he, like, just with the age creeping up on him. I, I just, I have a hard time getting motivated to take him. I would definitely prefer somebody like Cedric Mullins, who I think I can count on more for those stolen bases, even if even if he might be a great out less in, in batting average. Uh, I just don't I just don't want to think of early round picking a guy whose numbers decline even more, which is possible in Marte's case, and who misses a big chunk of the season, which also seems possible in his case. I I just I don't think we're at a point anymore with the way uh the the league landscape is evolving the way the distribution of stats is changing that the reward is is worth the risk for starling marte i think i think that's becoming not the case anymore starling marte has not hit 140 games played in a season since 2018 so much like george springer does usually miss about a quarter of the uh, seasons as you mentioned scott but you know if he can play 130 140 I still think he could be a 2020 bat, which is obviously very useful. And the Mets lineup is very good. So uh, yeah. I, I like Marte, but I agree. He's, he's probably going to be a, a pretty polarizing player this upcoming season. Uh, let's take a break here and then we'll, we'll come back with some rankings and we'll talk about some of those bigger names. Ronald Acuna, Juan Soto, we haven't talked about yet. But if you want to support your favorite fantasy baseball podcast, you could do that by heading over to the CBS Sports Store where we have FBT shirts, hoodies, sweatpants, hats, pine glasses, and much more. So search Fantasy Baseball Today, CBS Sports Store on the Google machine, or I just realized I didn't have this pulled up, but now I do. If you're watching us live on YouTube, I've got a QR code right here in the top right corner. Uh, Scott is uh, modeling it right now. Being, a, being Aunt Vanna here. <laughs> yes, so pull out your phone, take a picture of that. That'll bring you right to the CBS Sports Store. Uh, and then we have a great deal going on as well where through Wednesday, November 30th, so for the next two days after you're listening to this, you can use the promo code CYBER 
at checkout for 30% off your purchase. Again, this deal is only available through Wednesday, November 30th. Promo code CYBER for 30% off whatever you would like to get at the CBS Sports Store. Let's take a break, and we'll be back right after this. The news and notes. Let's talk about Bryce Harper, Scotty, who did indeed undergo Tommy John surgery, which we already knew. We talked about that recently. We knew he was having surgery. We didn't know that it was Tommy John. But the Phillies have indicated he could potentially miss the entire first half of the season. I think it's likely that he could be back in, at June, in June mm -hmm. at some point, and you know, just DH, and then they'll bring him along slowly. He'll start playing the outfield later on in the season. But I, I think if you want to play it safe, you should probably expect you know mid to late June at the earliest for Bryce Harper as of now. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, that's we went deep into it before when it would, there was a prospect of Tommy John surgery. We knew he was having surgery of some kind, and I kind of figured it would go this way. And that's the timetable we laid out then. Um, you know, mid-June is probably the best case scenario, though they did say he could be hitting competitively in like in games as early as mid-May. Like that must be the most extreme optimistic outcome because they also said, you know, hopefully he'll be back before the all-star break. Uh, so uh, yeah, let, we'll take the middle ground there as mid June as the hopeful outcome for Harper. And if he ends up missing time into July, it wouldn't surprise me. So that, that really tanks his value, obviously. And, uh, as I said at the time, you know, apparently I'm comparing everybody to Hunter Renfro today. That's about the point where I would take Bryce Harper. If he's projected to miss about half the season, which would be outside the top 100 players overall. And uh, I feel inclined to to stick with that. And, you know, if we're talking a 15-team league, uh, particularly 15-team league without IL spots, like NFPC, for instance, maybe even lower than that because, you know, the the, the replacement player, while Harper's out, isn't going to be as good. And, and obviously, you have to find a way to stash him on your bench for months. Well, I'm happy you brought that up, Scott, because there have been nine NFPC drafts over the past week. That's knowing the information about Bryce Harper and his ADP is 156 during that time. So that is the 13th ish round in a 12 team league. And that's the 11th round in a 15 teamer. So uh, he's, he's going pretty late. Early steamer projections have Bryce Harper for 79 games played this upcoming season. Hunter Renfro was traded to the angels in exchange for J Jansen junk, Elvis Paguero and Adam Seminaris. And this past season, Renfro hit 255 with 29 homers and an 807 OPS in 125 games. And he would have hit 31 games if he played uh, 31 homers, rather, if he played all of his games in Angel Stadium, Scott. So I don't really have a problem with this move in case people are wondering. It's a negative park shift. It's actually a completely neutral park shift for a right-handed batter power-wise over the past three seasons. So yeah, I, I kind of like this move. I'm, I've, I've been as much as I've been comparing players to Renfro in a disparaging way in this podcast. I actually think I'm one of the people, uh, one of the one of the fantasy personalities who appreciates Hunter Renfro the most. I think he's, I think he's been for the past couple years extremely underrated. I mean, that's it, 31 home runs if he played all his games at Angel Stadium last year. And that's over just 125 games because he yep. missed that time with injury. I mean, he was on pace for his his best season ever, and that was following up his actual best season ever. So uh, Angel Stadium, the past couple of years, it's actually played more favorably than than uh, what is what is where the Brewers play now. I think it's American, American Family Field. I think that's right. It'll always be Miller Park to me. Free endorsement for Miller. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Uh, He's, he should uh, he should be he should be a reliable source of power in the middle rounds at a time when reliable sources of power are becoming harder to find. And so I'll probably have a lot of Hunter Renfro. I have absolutely no problem with that. You get him as your outfield three, something like that. I like it for Hunter Renfro. On the other side, Scott, who do you think benefits for the Brewers? Now that Hunter Renfro is gone, you know, obviously play some outfield, a little bit of DH as well. They've got Garrett Mitchell. They have Esteri Ruiz, who we know stole a bunch of bases in the minors last year. They've got Sal Freelich, who looks like he's on the way. Keston Hiura could pick up some playing time at DH. John Singleton, there, dare I say, is <laughs> currently penciled in as their DH on roster resource. So what That's do you think? That's a fun name. Yeah. Former Astros prospect, if you don't know. 
walks a ton, but 31 years old now. Um, <laughs> Nando's ears are probably ringing somewhere right now. Cause he uh, I mean, I used to love him back in the day, but it's, it's been a hot minute. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's a good chance it's not on the roster, but if, if they, they stick with what they have, uh, I think Garrett Mitchell, um, you know, there was a chance he was going to get a good amount of playing time, but it becomes certain. And yeah, they're like, I was kind of surprised we didn't see Sal Freelick called up uh, at the end of this, uh, at the end of last year, uh, especially with the Brewers fighting for a playoff spot. I think he's better than Mitchell. I think he's, uh, you know, Stephen Kwan's kind of an extreme example, but I think, I think Sal Freelick has the same strengths as a Stephen Kwan. I don't know that'll get all the way there, but that's, that's kind of the the box he fits into, and I think I think that's going to be more interesting for fantasy purposes than Garrett Mitchell, unless Garrett Mitchell gets his like 80th percentile outcome and becomes like a a big time base dealer who also hits pretty well. I think the Stephen Kwan comp or call out rather for Sal Freelich is perfectly fine. I mean, he was a former 15th overall pick, first rounder back in 2021, and. This past season, he hit 331, 11 homers, 24 steals with only 63 strikeouts and 119 games in the minors. So there is a lot to like about Sal Freelick. If you're drafting early in some of these deeper leagues, definitely looking to take a shot on Sal Freelick later on. Mike Clevenger signed with the White Sox on a one-year, $8 million deal. And there were some okay moments this past year, first season back from Tommy John surgery. But overall, it wasn't great for Mike Clevenger. He had a 4.33 ERA, 1.20 whip, 7.2 K per nine, 10.6% swinging strike rate. Fastball velocity was down nearly two miles per hour from the last time we saw him in 2020. Ethan Katz has done some good work for the White Sox. He you know, obviously got Giolito's career back on track and Dylan Cease has turned into a top three Cy Young contender. So we'll see, Scott. You know, I guess cautiously optimistic in deeper leagues on Mike Clevenger. Yeah, I'm not optimistic. I think because you got to remember s- second Tommy John surgery. His first year back from his second Tommy John surgery, and that is a much tougher hill to climb. We saw the velocity down. We saw the effectiveness down, swinging strike rate. I think he's a back end guy now. And, uh, you know, the White Sox could use a back end guy, but could we in fantasy? Not so much. All right, fair enough. Let's move on to Michael Conforto, who remains engaged in hitting and throwing programs and isn't expected to face any restrictions for spring training. Looking to land a multi-year deal. We'll see if it happens. Mike uh, Miguel Cabrera plans to retire after the 2023 season where he will make $32 million. Good for you, Miguel Cabrera. Future first ballot Hall of Famer indeed. Carlos Santana signed a one-year $6.7 million deal with the Pirates. And they also acquired G-Man Choi and Lewin Diaz. So uh, two <laughs> misfits of first baseman and DH for, for the yeah. Pirates. You know, Carl, uh, Carlos Santana is at that point in his career where the Pirates start to look like a good option, which is not not a ringing endorsement for him. I, You know, I would have to confirm this. I don't know. Who said, I saw it somewhere on Twitter. But yeah, it's true, actually. MLB trade rumors tweeted out the pirates signing Carlos Santana to a near $7 million deal is their largest free agent deal since 2016. Yeah. Think and I think, that. think, I about think that. it isn't that wasn't that Francisco Liriano three for 39 or maybe it was someone, maybe that even came before, but I think that might be the largest free agent deal they've ever handed out. I'm just like recklessly throwing out, these superlatives when I only, uh, I don't know for sure that they're correct, but yeah, they, they have not been, uh, they have not been spenders. That's for sure. That is just a really, really bad look for the game of baseball. And I I don't know that it's going to change anytime soon. Scott, let's quickly run through some early 2023 outfield rankings. And we'll start with the top six that you have here, including Aaron judge. No surprise there. Mookie Betts, Julio Rodriguez, Ronald Acuna, Jordan Alvarez and Juan Soto. Let's talk about Ronald Acuna, his first year back from the torn ACL. It was a disappointing one, Scott. He had 266 with 15 homers, 29 steals, actually ran way more than we thought. And it was the power that took a huge step back. 
Uh, his He hit more ground balls. His home run to fly ball ratio uh, obviously is not where we wanted it to be. Just did not look ha- healthy. And I, I don't think he could have generated power in the air, Scott. That's what I was noticing for Ronald Acuna. This is really just a bet on a young player who one more year removed, going to be healthy next year, and hopefully can get back to those elite, elite level numbers. Yeah, that's the hope. And there isn't a lot to back up that hope other than, okay, well, we all know who Ronald Acuna was before the knee injury. And he was taking time off periodically throughout 2022 to rest that knee. So, you know, it wasn't quite 100%. I think it's a pretty good hope. I mean, I'd still take Ronald Acuna in round one. I I believe I have him uh, sixth overall, just behind Julio Rodriguez. But if not for that uncertainty, you know, Ronald Acuna would be the most likely choice to go one overall. I mean, we've seen him come close to 40-40 production before. The hope is he gets back to that, but it's not a guarantee. And he burned a lot of people this past season who invested a first-round pick in him, even knowing he'd miss about a month of the year. From one player who burned you to another, Juan Soto, who you have ranked as your sixth outfielder heading into next season. It was quite a disaster, Scott. 242 batting average, 27 homers is fine, 6 steals, 62 RBI. That's a really big letdown for Juan Soto as well. It was uh, a big year for Soto where traded from the Nationals to the Padres. I think sometimes we get lost, Scott, in the human element of the game where you know he's hearing these trade rumors all year. He's obviously changing locations, moving to the other side of the country. I don't want to make excuses for the guy, but obviously there was a lot going on for Juan Soto. Um, there was stuff that wasn't go, wasn't working well. Uh, the batted ball data, he changed some things. It looks like he was selling out to try and hit fly balls. That's not really something he's ever done before. He also struggled against lefties a lot, something he also has never done ever before. I'm looking at the player who, through 2021, he had 2,000 plate appearances, Scott, where he hit 301 with a 981 OPS. I'm just, just going to blindly hope that he gets back to doing those types of things. Yeah, me too. I mean, that's I'm, me even more so, right? Because you're, you rank, are, are you taking Juan Soto in the first round? To me, it's, I, I think he's a borderline. First round pick. I, yeah, I, I think he's a late first rounder. I would take Kyle Tucker over him myself, but I think I have him eighth overall Soto uh, ahead of Kyle Tucker. And I, yeah, let's not lose sight of the fact that entering this past season, Juan Soto, like he was, everybody's choice is this is the best hitter in baseball now. Yep. So, you know, we can't lose sight of that. I mean, he was on his, a historic pace. We had never really seen a hitter do what he had done over those first few years of his career. I mean, he's the best on base guy since like Barry Bonds. I mean, who's the best on base guy ever. Uh, and that continued. He still walked at an incredible rate. It's why Juan Soto, for at, as underwhelming as his season was, he was still the sixth best outfielder in points leagues. And so it's it's an easy call to take him in that format because you know the walks are going to... Uh, in fact, he might be the number two or number three overall pick in that format uh, if, if we're expecting the, the hitting to improve. And, and I do expect the hitting to improve. He's still... Like his stack has page is still lit up like a Christmas tree. Still hit the ball very hard. He did put it on the ground too often. But he's put it on the ground more often in the past. Like, that's been a long-standing issue for Juan Soto, and it never impacted his production until last year. So I just think I think the combination of a slow start, and then when he was starting to turn it around, he got traded, and there was a lot of pressure with to come with that trade. I mean, it was like the biggest return ever in a trade. Uh, yeah. So I, I, it was just a weird season for Juan Soto, but uh, given... Like he just turned 24 in the off season. So <laughs> it's crazy. Like there's there's no reason to think he's declining or anything like that. I I think I think he'll he's he's gonna bounce back with monster production, the kind that we've gotten accustomed to seeing from him prior to this year. You know, explaining it the way you just did, Scott, it reminds me a lot of a player signing a, a mega deal with a new team and they struggle that first year of the contract, right? And we've seen that time and time again. Francisco Lindor, I guess technically he was traded and then signed an extension, but struggled with the Mets his first year. Javier Baez his past season struggled big time with the Tigers. Bryce Harper his first year with the Phillies. These things happen. So it would not surprise me if, if Juan Soto 
just goes back to being Juan Soto this year. 7 through 12 in the outfield ranks, we have Kyle Tucker, Mike Trout, Michael Harris, Kyle Schwarber, Luis Robert, and Starling Marte. Luis Robert is the name we haven't mentioned yet, and it was a disappointing year, Scott. 284 batting average, 12 homers, 11 steals, and only 98 games played. He has struggled big time to stay on the field so far in his brief uh, MLB career. Uh, the power definitely tanked, and it took a step back. But the one thing I love, Scott, we didn't know if it would remain his strikeout rate. In 2021, he got it all the way down to 20%. This past year, it was below 20%. I think if Luis Robert can stay on the field, which, again, is a big if, I still think that there is pretty big upside for him. Yeah, there's definitely first-round potential for Luis Robert now that now that we can confidently project him to help in batting average because those, that strikeout rate is held, uh, those gains have held the past couple years. So if we know he's going to help in that category course we see the kind of raw power he has we know he can run and hopefully he'll get back to doing that more uh since the rules are going to make it easier to steal bases the big question i think for Luis robert and and the reason why we can't draft him on that first round potential is because he has yet to play even a hundred games in a season yep. now it's only been three seasons in the first was a 60 game season. So I don't want to make, you know, we, we only have so much history of him getting hurt, but he got hurt a lot in the minors too, you know, and he's missed huge chunks of the past two seasons. So best case scenario, Lu Luis Robert is a steal worst case scenario. And I think maybe most likely scenarios you end up drafting him a little too early because of the dumb amount of time he misses. And you know what? I used to say this about Aaron Judge, too. Luis Robert, he is a physical freak. Like, this guy is built. He's he's really strong. And, you know, for, for Judge back in the day, it seemed like he would always wind up pulling something or, you know, he was swinging too hard. It's like, guys this big are almost not meant to be yeah. baseball players. So it's, I, not, it's not a great sport for really muscular dudes. Yeah. Uh, then. So we, we would be great at it, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to be strong, <laughs> just not muscular. There's right. Difference. Yeah. You yeah. have that that skinny guy strength or that big boy strength, and we have neither. No, no, we certainly do not. Um, yeah, Luis Robert, get on that that Aaron Judge uh, yoga routine that he's been using, which has magically helped him stay healthy the past two seasons. 13 through 18 in the rankings, we have Randy Arozarena, Cedric Mullins, Dalton Varsho, Teoscar Hernandez, Adolis Garcia, and George Springer. We spoke about all these names earlier. Dalton Varsho currently being thrown around in trade rumors, so we'll see what happens with that. Uh, it does seem... Is this a little low for Adolis Garcia, Scott? You know, he's done it two years in a row now. Just finished as a top six outfielder this past season. It seems a touch low. Yeah, so here's here's my gripe about Adolis Garcia, and it's going to sound a little like Bobby Witt, except in Bobby Witt's case, there's the hope that there's still this untapped upside. Him being as young as he is, him being of the pedigree that he is. Uh, it's not the case for Adolis Garcia. He's already 29. So he's not getting better than this in all likelihood. And he was a 300 on base guy. He was a 286 on base guy in 2021. Bad on base guy. How the heck did he score 88 runs? <laughs> like, it's a really fluky thing. Um, and you know, he's 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 a capable center fielder, uh, but he's not a standout. And in fact, he, by the end of the year, he was playing more right field. So it's not like it's not like his defense. Um you know, I'm mostly just basing this on defensive war and maybe somebody will find some, uh, have some other stat that contradicts this, but I it doesn't, like, I feel like he's a good defender. I could be making that up. I know he has a, I know he has a cannon for an arm. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe I'll cool it with that, but I don't think he's such a good defender that if he struggles, if he's hitting like 220 with, which is with, with as much as he strikes out seems possible. And, and you know, his on base percentage is going to be just horrendous. If that's the case, mm -hmm. like I could see him losing playing time. Yeah. The Rangers have a lot of young guys they're working in. 
and more to come. I could see it happening. And I do think natural regression is coming in RBI and especially run score. So uh, he's going to take a step back. The other issue, the other reason I haven't ranked as low as 16th is because like, who do I drop behind him? Um, I mean, I, if, if the numbers just hold up completely, I guess Adolis Garcia is in the same range as Cedric Mullins and Randy Rosarena. Doesn't he have more upside than selling Marte at this point, Scott? I don't think so. He has more power upside. Um, he just had more steals. But, yeah, but we know Starling. Like, if we're talking upside, I'm not saying he can't beat Starling Marte's steals total this year, but Starling Marte's been a 40 steal guy before. I mean, Garcia's not doing sure. that. And we know Starling Marte is going to beat him by like 50 points of batting average at least. So there, there's a health concern there, but I'd rather have Marte. And I don't even really want Marte that much. Yeah, I think part of it is just I'm putting him at the I'm putting Adolis Garcia at the back end of a tier because if somebody else wants to take him higher in that tier, I'm fine with it. I think there are more risk factors for him. Uh, you know, I've got to do more research on Adolis Garcia, but I'm I'm kind of feeling it, kind of feeling it. Him and Corey Seager. I guess I got to break out the Rangers hat again, Scott, because mm. those those are two. You got to break I out the Santa out. hat, though. You can't yeah. wear. You're right. You're right. I'll we'll save the Rangers hat. I'll, I'll save the Rangers hat for January first. You're right. Yeah. We'll wait for the, the calendars to change over. Uh, 19 through 24 in the outfield ranks, and this is kind of where we'll put a bow on things here. Uh, uh, Eloy Jimenez, Byron Buxton, Brian Reynolds, Corbin Carroll, Giancarlo Stanton, and Chris Bryant. Think about the names I just read and how many games they've played <laughs> this past season, or even recently, right? And this is what I wanted to get at when we started the show. Eloy Jimenez has yet to play more than 122 games. Byron Buxton has only played 100 games once in his career. That was back in 2017. John Carlos Stanton hasn't played 140 since 2018. Uh, Chris Bryant just played 42 games this past season. Other names that we mentioned earlier, George Springer misses time routinely. Uh, Starling Marte has missed time in the past. Luis Robert misses time. Mike Trout misses time. You know, Aaron Judge has missed time in the past. I don't know that that's going to happen again. He stayed healthy for two years in a row. But again, we're only 24 outfielders in, and a lot of these guys are probably going to miss time. So just keep that in mind. It's, so there is there is a, a drop-off here, yes. But this isn't even the biggest drop-off. A big drop-off is coming soon after this. Uh, you know, if, if I could just read. So Brian, I have 24th here. Continuing Tyler O'Neill, Christian Yelich, Stephen Kwan, Hunter Renfro, Anthony Santander, Taylor Ward. That takes us through 30. And after that is where it just drops off a cliff. And it's like, I don't, I don't want any more outfielders, but I five outfielder league, I have to draft some. So yeah. what I'm saying is as unappealing as this uh 22 through or I'm sorry, 19 through 24 group might look. Like it's still probably a group. It, for me, I'm going to be eager to draft from it. Like Brian Reynolds, who is is the one who uh, the most uh, durable of this group, the one who you don't really have to worry about a missing time. I'm going to have a ton of Brian Reynolds. I know the batting average suffered, and I know he played for the Pirates, so the runs in RBI suffered, which wasn't the case in 2021. For what it's worth, he had plenty in both of both that year. So I don't know. I don't know what changed with the Pirates. Maybe it was just really good luck in 2021, really bad luck in 2020. I don't know. But he continued to hit for power in 2022. I'm not sure if I said those years right. <laughs> um, he continued to hit for power in 2022 after, uh, even with the changes to the ball, even when he seemed like a candidate to maybe lose those power gains, and he didn't. So I think that's really encouraging. He also has... Nine, uh, he also has 75th percentile sprint speed, does Brian Reynolds. Never been a big day stealer, but that could be changing for him. He he seems like somebody who could really benefit from the rule changes and suddenly become a contributor in that category. And we've seen him hit for a high average in the past. He doesn't strike out a lot. He hits a lot of line drives. I, I could see Brian Reynolds becoming the complete package in a best-case scenario, and, he, and you don't have to worry about him missing time. So I... Before the drop off, he's going to be a guy I'm taking a lot in the outfield. Gosh, I have a lot I want to say about all these guys. I think Aloy Jimenez, even though he has um, 
durability problems like Luis Robert. I, I was really encouraged by the way he came back from injury this year, and I'm, I'm back to feeling confident he can be a 290 hitting 30 homer guy if he can stay healthy. Big if. Yep. But obviously that would be really valuable at this point if he can. Byron Buxton, of course, big if with the health there as well. Corbin, Corbin Carroll in, in um, leagues with really savvy people is probably going to get drafted a lot higher than this because of the the top prospect pedigree, the belief he's going to be a big base stealer. I, I don't I don't think he needs to be. I feel like upside wise, you know, Aloy Jimenez, Byron Buxton, they have plenty of upside too. So I, I just I don't know that there's a need to reach for Corbin Carroll beyond or earlier than this 22nd. And I wanted to say for Giancarlo Stanton, you know, he still hits the ball incredibly hard. His best case scenario still has him among the home run leaders. Giancarlo Stanton hit 166 over the final four months of the season. Uh that was after his first IL stint, so maybe he was never quite healthy after that. But that is really bad, and um, and yet we're I'm, I'm still including him among the good outfielders, which is kind of a kind of a statement on the whole position. And he did underperform: two eleven batting average, two forty xba, four sixty two slug, four seventy seven expected slug. So it seems like there was some bad luck going on for. Uh, John Carlos Stanton as well. I again, like at, when you get to this point, you probably want him as like, your third outfielder. So if that's the case, you need two of the top twenty or so uh, to to ensure that. Um, I was talking with one of my buddies today, Scott, and I think trying to get three outfielders in the top ten rounds this year, if you play in a five outfielder league, should be a priority for you. So yeah, I mean, I'm gonna go beyond that. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, something's going to have to suffer because of that. Probably first base. I'm probably going to be, I'm probably just ignoring all early round first basemen, to be honest. Um, cause you know, I'm prioritizing third base early and second base early outfields right up there. And you know, I'm waiting a long time for starting pitcher. So yeah, starting pitcher and first base are the positions I'm waiting at this year and shortstop, I guess too, just because like, I'm a little more willing to take an early round shortstop, but it'd have to be a good value. All right, we're going to wrap there for a festive Scott White. I am Frank Stample. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again on Wednesday night and in your audio feeds on Thursday morning. Bye-bye.